Welcome to the PlayStation Podcast, your place for all things ceramic. We have our very first and lovely guest here today, the Queen of Ceramics herself, the Australian boss of ceramics. I'd love to introduce her to you. It's my pleasure, it's my honour to have as our very first guest on the show today, Janet Debus. Very, You're very welcome to the show. Thank you very much for coming. My pleasure. My pleasure entirely. Excellent. Um, luckily... luckily just got the kiln turned on. <laughs> oh, that is good timing. <laughs> I was hoping uh, the timing would be okay during the day for you. So um, it's it's great. It's, lo- it's good to have you here. Uh, actually, uh, had a- I'm glad all of our recording stuff's working good now because um, I had a, uh, a long time ago, I had an interview with uh, you and Craig and I thought I was recording our interview, but nothing worked. <laughs> so um, oh. I'm, go- I'm glad everything's going well now. Uh, okay, so let's roll into this. Um, uh, I think you did get the memo, the questions, some of the questions I forward through to you. Yep. Yes, I did. I did a lot. Excellent, excellent. Um, okay, so first, let me um, first tell tell a bit about yourself. Uh, where whereabouts are you from? Uh, where did you grow up? What was your childhood like? Mm. It's a big question. It's a okay. Long, it, um, it's not that far back. <laughs> no. Well, <laughs> when you're my age, it is. Um, I was born in Melbourne. Um, we lived there for a short while, then moved to Adelaide for a short while. Then we moved to Newcastle and lived there for uh, about three years where I started school. I started primary school and I met my first live potter. And um, then uh, we moved to Sydney and I basically had my childhood in the suburbs of Sydney, the southern suburbs of Sydney. Okay. Um, okay. And then left home as soon as I could and moved into Glebe. Hmm. Okay, so you were in Newcastle when you was introduced to ceramics at, at a certain age? Is that correct? Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't really introduced to it. But we had family friends, uh, one of whom was, well, as she was then, she was Madeline Jones. Um, and she was married to uh, a poet who taught English at the university there and was part of my parents' social circle. And his wife, Madeline Jones, um, or Madeline herself, she was a potter. She was English and she was a potter. And um, it always seemed kind of distant and exotic to me but then she took part in these kids carnivals that used to be held during the holidays on Lake Macquarie and they were called a Wabakul Kanara. Um, they used the Indigenous language which was quite unusual in those days mm. um, and it was a coming together of people of that region and they asked local artists to teach into that so we had a nice guy called Bill from Wanji. His name was Bill Dobell. Um, and um, he taught us drawing and painting and we had Madeline teaching us pottery. And I made my first pot under her tutelage. Uh, what age was that? I thought it was... Um, I was about seven then, I think, something like that. Oh. Wow, yeah, I thought it was going to be a huge pot. <laughs> it was quite small. Well, I'm sure it was, it was a lot bigger um, in comparison to your size at that time. <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it was, but it was still quite modest. Um, yeah, so that was, um, that was the first introduction. And then um, my mum took up when we moved to Sydney, my mother who'd always been interested in the arts and probably and always wanted to go to art school right. um, but couldn't. Uh, she took up pottery like a lot of people did in the 60s. And um, so there was always you know somebody making pots around the place. Um, 
but she was she was what was called a hobby potter and that was to a degree dismissed in those days um i don't like the term hobby potter very much for a whole series of reasons that included um, I prefer to talk about amateurs and professionals because an amateur is somebody who loves what they do. Right. Um, so my mother was an amateur, um, but she, uh, I wanted to do something with my hands and I tried sculpture classes at the local tech in the evening. This is in the evening after school. And I was hopeless at that because um, it was all men in the class and they'd all done metalwork and woodwork at school. So everything stuck together, but mine fell apart. <laughs> and so my mother said, why don't you try pottery? Come along to pottery with me. You know, by this time I was in my teens, you know, and going to a class with your mum was pretty daggy. But uh, um, your mother, did she have any other sort of art backgrounds as well, like in painting or drawing? No, she just always loved it. She was always a very good drawer, um, as was my father, but neither of them followed it as a career. My mother, because her older sister got to go to art school, but um, she had a widowed mother and so she had to leave school early to help her mother in her cafe um, in in Scotland, in Edinburgh. Mm. Do, you, do you feel... So... Sorry. <laughs> Uh, do you feel that um, your mother's uh, background, uh, creative background or I interest in uh, the ceramics industry and your experience um, uh, fr from uh, high school or from school, uh, do you feel that sort of influences what you're doing uh, now or through your um, early or middle stages of your career? Yeah. Yes, unquestionably, unquestionably, um, because I've I've done quite a lot of teaching, um, on and off, in and out of teaching, but I've always um, I've always valued um, those people who go and do classes at institutions and um, never never really get to be professionals, but many start out, many professionals start out with those classes. And I think they're enormously valuable. Um, they're, so I've always loved teaching them. And I, I continue to do that sort of stuff. You know, I've been involved with um, the local one teacher school out here in a, an art project that they did. And I've taught classes for kids at risk who come to a horse riding outfit nearby. Um, and I think that putting back into the community, because if you consider the structure of our community like a triangle, you have to have a very broad base for it to be robust and continue to function well. Um, and I think we have an obligation, those of us who have had the benefit of having, um, you know, been able to develop professional careers put back into um, essentially fertilize the soil <laughs> yeah that's that's yeah correct, correct um that broad foundation uh steers towards a, a pivotal direction doesn't it yeah 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 um so with your own direction um did you initially get training under your voice is a little your voice is is very it's disappeared now uh sorry about that uh, might, might, might be my connection, um, so I do apologise about that. That's okay. Um, in terms of uh, your direction from an early age uh, going forward, uh, do you mm. did you get training like th uh, or guidance under a particular person, like an apprenticeship, or did you go through a very academical direction? Or do you feel that you're very self-taught step-by-step throughout the way? Yeah, I, I think probably uh, none of those. I, um, I, I really stumbled into it by chance. As I said, I went along to tech classes that were right. evening classes. And I was still doing those when I was at university doing a science degree. And um, 
I, I, I must admit, I had fairly based desires then. I mean, I wanted to be with the cool set, and pottery was very cool. And it still, there, it still is. There were, there were, it still is. <laughs> it's, it still is. It's cooler now. Um, but there were a lot of really interesting people doing those evening classes. You know, there were architects and designers and and people who had professional lives that were quite outside my sphere of experience and certainly outside, you know, what I, what I knew um, generally. And then they, they were all very keen on, on pottery too. And they said, um, we've just found out there's a special glaze club course being run in a, um, East Sydney Tech. Um, it's going to be run one night a week by Peter Rushforth. And um, they said, do you want to come with us to that? You know, did I ever want to? I would have gone anywhere with them. That was such a cool set, even, you know, a glaze class. And um, so I went with them um, and it meant I got a lift in and out in a sports car, which was pretty cool because um, we lived about 10 kilometres away. And... Um, at the end of the course, um, Peter Rushforth said, what are you going to do next year when you graduate? And I said, oh, you know, I don't know. I really don't know. I'm not sure. I'd done prac teaching. I wasn't sure I wanted to do science teaching. And he said, why don't you come and study ceramics full time? And so I owe it all to him. I thought I couldn't think of a good reason not to. Well, so I did. So he was like a first yeah. uh, major like, or sort of like a influencer or mentor in your life at that point? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, he's, he's, he continued to open doors for me. I was very lucky um, in, in meeting him and, um, and the fact that he, um, I don't know, he saw something in me that was worth encouraging. And that counts an enormous amount when you're a young person. I mean, you, you've probably had that too, you know, all the people who, who show confidence in what you do and, um, oh, it's and it's been, enormously it's, important. It's a huge factor for everyone. Um, I think it's not necessarily for younger, but for every people of all ages, it really affects hmm. us because um, it really stimulates us mentally to keep going and yeah. creates um, a positive attitude. Uh, and fuels that drive that I think we need to keep developing our skills. Uh, um, but I, I'm really appreciative of the um, the support that, especially yourself, that you give for uh, younger generations of potters and ceramicists, people who are trying to learn. Uh, and you, you always take on a lot of people and you always give your advice very openly. I think that's a huge... Um, like yourself, yeah. like well, a, you're, you're a major influencer within the industry, um, like with many generations, I think. Yeah, it's um, uh, it, it's that thing I said earlier about I benefited from it and I feel I, one of the things my parents did instill in me is um, that success is really just yours alone. Um, that you know, that usually there are a lot of people who have contributed to it, and the other thing was not to be fearful um, and say, Yes, I can do that. Yeah, I can do that. If somebody asks you to do something, um, to actually say yes and step up to it, and, and I think that that kind of attitude means that you do, you do give back to. People, because you, you can, can see yourself in some respect. respect. You, know, you can see yourself. yourself. Um, mm. Yeah. What we give out always comes back, doesn't it? Hmm. It, it does. does. And, and, and you know, know Peter, Peter Rushforth, um, he, he opened doors for me. And even once when I, I resigned from a job within the taste system, system because there were um, there was a culture of um, it was you know. God's sake, it was the 70s and all the rest of it, but there was a culture of sexual abuse and power, and um, I'm, I'm not against sexual pleasure at all, but I am absolutely against using it um, for, for purposes of power. 
and um, there was a lot of that going on and I, I resigned and um, I thought about transferring to another college but there were no jobs being advertised and when Peter found found out that I had done that, he got in touch with the Director General of Technical Education and had my resignation rescinded and he created a job for me, which is a big show of faith. Mm. It's huge. Um, yeah, so it was um, – so he's done a number of things like that when I've, I've probably behaved um, uh, in, not impetuously but, you know, done something on, on a principle – um yeah that's that's a very huge huge and you know the leap. Whole, whole it was yeah a big thing yeah a big thing um and so you 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 build up those sort of relationships i think what, that's one of the reasons why um i find you know in china i found doors have opened as well because it's essentially a confucian society everybody gets hung up on um, that it's uh, a communist society, but the society itself is run on Confucian lines and it's built on trust. You know, business is built on trust and um, it's people worry about things like, you know, they say you don't have contracts with the factories, you know, you, you don't have a contract, a written contract. And I say no, because I've never, you know, never demanded one, I've never been abused. Um, and they would do anything for me and I would do anything for them. You know, that, that's fortunate. But it also is partly behaving that way with yourself, taking risks um, and doing something that's, that's not necessarily what the pundits say you should do. It becomes a very positive yeah. uh business relationship, doesn't it, between uh, employer, employer, employee, 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 employee. Yeah. Uh, if only we could have maybe yeah. a little bit more around here. <laughs> it might be a bit better. Um, <laughs> uh, so that's going, yeah, from, no, um, going from study to work. Uh, at what point did you feel um, that you, um, like I know we're always – we're always studying and learning new things in ceramics, but at what point did you feel that you went from being a student of ceramics to actually working and um, running your life as a career in ceramics? Um, yeah, that was one of the questions, and I was trying to think what that was. Um, I, I taught a class, um, a Saturday class at the Potter Society uh, in Sydney. It was then called the Potter Society, Australian Ceramic Association. They had a studio in Woolloomooloo and um, uh, there was a Saturday class going there. The school was being run at that stage by Peter Travis. Mm. And, and uh, Peter had become uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, he was highly influential in my interest in glazes. Um, I... Um, He'd just come back from working with a, a, a man called Herbert Sanders who wrote a book called Glazers for Special Effects um, and on Peter's Churchill Fellowship, uh, he'd stopped in, uh, the, he'd been in the States and he worked with Herbert Sanders and he came back with this enthusiasm for doing masses of colour tests um, and triaxials that were not based on formulae, but were based on recipes. Okay. And um, it was exciting. It was, it was so exciting because most of the people we had teaching glaze, um, they, they used Unity Formula, and I didn't have a problem understanding that because I studied science, you know, so the idea of formulae and calculations was okay. But I didn't understand why... In ceramics, we um, we do all of that if we're studying glaze properly. Um, and I think the thing is, when we study glaze properly, what we need to do is to look at glazes. You know, that's that's the research. Look at what's happened when you change something. 
and learning to look at glazes is the um, is the real key. I mean, it's why Greg Daly and I in we get on very very well. Um, we job shared for six years. I mean, actual job shared. We were allowed to choose our own weeks and our own teaching blocks, um, but just received half a salary as long as one of us was there, which is, again, a big show of trust. Mm. Um, but it suited us because, you know, Greg would be overseas. He was um, president of Craft Australia at the time. And, um, you know, I'd be preparing for an exhibition or he'd be preparing for an exhibition and, so we wanted to have time off and the other would do full-time teaching. Um, and, but Greg and I, we talk glaze the same way because we've done so many damn tests. Mm. You know, we've looked at so many. And so we would, look at, we would look at a test. It used to be a kind of a joke thing. We would look at it and he said, he'll say, will you go first or will I? Um, and inevitably we would have exactly the same answer. Yeah. That must be astonishing to having to work with Peter Tra Travis um, extensively. Like I've only met him personally just one time and I feel extremely yeah. grateful just to have that one experience with him. Whereas um, the amount he of knowledge. Extraordinary. Yeah. 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 He was an extraordinarily talented man. Um, and I got to know him quite well personally because he lived in Glebe also and I had a car and he didn't have a car and he, um, we had, you know, the same, the same kind of night owl habits. Mm. Um, so we, we spent quite a lot of time together and it was one of the uh, most rewarding friendships. Yeah. Yeah. He was an exceptional man. Very funny. <laughs> Very funny. There was actually um, uh, there was actually one question on um, Reddit, um, from uh, at Muja Cat. Uh, the person asks, "How did you make it work out financially in the early days of your career?" Um, I bar made it a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, I always I always had part time jobs. Um, and I switched to barmaiding because it was the only job at the time that paid equal wages with men for a relatively unskilled one. Waitressing didn't. Um, and then, as I said, I, I applied for and I got a teaching job on a Saturday doing a class there. And then um, I, I was making a, f making a few pots, you know, and selling a few, but not really making a living from it. And um, there was a, a woman who'd been in the year behind me uh, at East Sydney um, called Helen Gulliver. And she, she was very, very um, businesslike about her career. You know, she, she had, they had money enough to buy a house, which she used as a studio, um, a small house in an area where they were cheap at the time. Um, but it was not so far from where she lived. And she had a kiln there and um, it was an electric kiln and that was regarded as very, um, you know, kind of, well, you know, it must be hobby ceramics, you know, if you've got an electric kiln. Mm. But I used her kiln a lot and um, I craved an electric kiln of my own. Um, anyway, um, I had a, a share in a block of land up at Mudgee, um, just a, uh, it was a 500 acre piece of bush, but I had friends next door who had a farm and we decided that we would, um, we would run summer schools up there. We thought that would be good. Um, and I'd started doing a little bit of TAFE teaching at this time. So there'd always been a little bit of teaching around. And um, I was teaching in Canberra at the time. Um, that was the, the only place where there was teaching available. And again, that was a door opened by Peter, um, Peter Rushforth. And um, we decided we'd run these um, residential summer schools. So pe people came and camped and we built a kiln. They were five-day schools and we built, built a kiln 
made the pots, fired the kiln and opened it in five days, a wood fired kiln. Um, and the first, I always got someone who was good with wood kilns and the first one was um, Bill Samuels, um, whom I had, had only just met. I didn't know him well, but I asked him if he would come and teach it in one. And the way we ran them was that uh, we would just split five ways the amount of money that we made from it. And he, he was willing to do that. So uh, had Bill Samuels build the first one, which was a, um, a Bury Box kiln. Um, and it was a, a regular Bury Box kiln, but with quite a big throat um, and uh, a sort of pit where you could put pots to get some, some ash. Um, and then we had Steve Harrison. He came and he built a wonderful kiln that um, because I said I wanted to have a wood kiln up there that I could use myself. And it was uh, a play kiln. It was, um, was big enough for the school, but it had a firebox bigger than the chamber. Um, and it meant that uh, I was sharing house in Glebe at that time with a woman called Terry Wright, who um, had studied in South Africa. And we used to um, take pots up there, pack the kiln, fire it and unpack it in a weekend. Um, and it was fantastic. It was, they are such efficient uh, kilns, the Bury Box kilns, um, that I've always been a bit in love with them. Although I, I really like Anagama firings and um, Cole Levy's early work, I can still remember seeing that um, BZ show that was in, I think it was the Westpac Gallery in, in Martin Place and just being blown away by that. Um, but I think, I think tackling a lot of things like that, that were a bit outside the norm at the time, you know, to have people come and camp and, and fire a kiln was a bit, it's a bit hippie, I guess. The, the, a um, hippie. the thing that I personally love about um, wood firing is the sense of community that it brings. Yeah, yeah, unquestionably, unquestionably, mm. yeah. And then so yeah, it's, um, so your experience going from an electric kiln to a wood fire kiln, um, have you been, did, were you like converted over to being a wood fire or did you sort of stick to your guns in the no, electric field? No, no. What, what happened was um, I, I had a career, I guess, that was largely supported by teaching. That was my regular income. And so I would make work for exhibitions and things like that, but that was variable. But I always wanted to run a production pottery and I'd never done that. I'd never done it properly. You know, I'd done all these other bits and pieces and projects. And um, my partner at the time and my partner, as it turned out for over 35 years, um, he, he was a sailor and um, I, used to go sailing with him. Um, he did charter work in the Mediterranean. And um, we, we did that and I, I got study leave to go and study Byzantine pots um, and would do it in between, you know, being number one hand and breakfast cook on the boat. Um, and that was all good. And then he gave that up um, and we came back to Australia and we had a baby and he wanted to be back here with us. He didn't want to go away for the, those prolonged times. And you can't have a baby on a charter boat when you're trying to run it as a business. So we came back here and um, I made pots for a while. And then um, we, I had just resigned from head, I'd been head at East Sydney at this stage um, and I always felt a bit of a fraud doing it because it's about production pottery. You know, it was always about making a living from pottery and I'd never done it. And um, anyway, we, we delivered this boat. Michael oversaw the building of a boat in the States, in Wisconsin, and we had to deliver it to um, France. So we took it out through the Great Lakes with baby <laughs> and... Um, I got off the boat in France and I went and stayed with a friend in Greece 
and um, then Michael, again, was missing us. So he left the boat and came to join us and we, we sat there drinking a lot of bad Greek wine and saying, what are we going to do with the rest of our lives? You know, here we are. And I said, well, I've always wanted to run a production pottery and he said, well, I've always wanted to build a building. So we did and um, it was actually a very good partnership because he wasn't a potter and he had studied economics um, at school so he understood how you know businesses were meant to work. We decided to do it on his property um, because we had a house on that we could live uh, there whilst we were building the pottery and we both did drawings of what we thought a pottery building should look like and mine was the usual size, you know, conventional box thinking. And he did this enormous building. And he, and I said, that, that's huge. And he said, but I don't know any one of your friends who's ever said, gee, I'm glad I built my pottery that big. Mm. <laughs> They're always complaining about lack of room. And it was cheaper to build the whole thing in one go in some respects, get the basic structure there than it was to build a series of separate buildings, you know, a separate kiln room, a separate um, wet studio, a separate glazing studio, all of those things. And so um, we we started Brindabella Pottery. We, um, we had a friend who was a graphic designer at the National Gallery and he, um, he did a poster for us which um, had photos of what we did and I hand wrote to make it look quite authentic, um, hand wrote what the things were, and um, and we started. We took part in a um, a craft fair, one of the first craft fairs run in Australia. It was held in um, Kings Cross at a hotel in Kings Cross, and we took our stuff up there. And um, we were such neophytes to it, we didn't realise that when you sold the stuff, you didn't have anything left to show people um, and you weren't allowed, people weren't allowed to take work away with them. They, you always had to have a full store. And all of the other people there, um, not potters, there weren't so many potters doing this, but people who sold baskets and textiles and things like that, imported textiles, a lot of them, um, they had vans parked outside with backup stock so as soon as they sold something, they would replace it in their stand. But we'd never done that before. So we just sold everything and stood there. But it meant that we got known, um, which was good. And um, then we just started making pots. And, and Michael, so we decided that we would not do any uh, selling from the studio because that interrupted making too much that we would try to not employ people because that was an obligation. And if you wanted to just up and go away for a holiday, you had to make arrangements for other people. Um, we decided that we would do wholesale only, which was quite a biggie at the time. So we only ever sold wholesale and we had minimum wholesale orders, which back in that those days was... Um, was very, very rare. You know, we had a minimum wholesale order of $500 initially, which was quite a lot of money back in the 70s. Um, or it was, no, this was early 80s, was about 82. But it was still quite a lot of money for a wholesale order of pottery. And then we put it up to $1,000 very soon afterwards because it worked so well. And I think having somebody who wasn't a potter um, enabled me to see um, through a different lens how you might run the business, yeah. As a lot of these um, new techniques weren't really used within uh, ceramic businesses in Australia before, did you try to uh, have some um, influence from like uh, – uh, Japan or Korean or Chinese ceramic businesses, how, how their studios are set up to how their uh, production and their business strategies are set? No, no, it, it never, um, 
that was something that never um, even occurred to me, you know, to set it up in that style. And um, because I was teaching, that satisfied a need to kind of be passing on skills. Um, I think that need is there, you know, I feel that, mm. that need. Um, and, and now what happens is I occasionally, I will have, you know, just a small workshop. There might be just two or three people come and do it. Um, and they'll, it's almost like a mentoring, um, but it, it'll, it might be a specific workshop about glaze or it might be about particular technique, you know, developing terra sigillata or something like that, throwing. Talking about um, workshops, you, ac you actually have a workshop on this Sunday, don't you? Uh, From what I've this read. Sunday, next Sunday. Next Sunday, yes. Next, yes, yes, I do. I hope that goes well. Yes. I hope that goes well. Yes, very soon, isn't it? No, yeah. no, no, no. It's um, next month. You, you're getting me worried. It's next month. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, on the um, <gasps> it's on the sixth or the seventh, seventh, I think. That of March. Yes, yes. Seventh. Of March. Seventh yeah. of March. So if anyone's over... listening, but it is sold out. I think it has sold out. Yeah. So it's very yeah, good. Yeah, Jane's good running hear. a second one. Nice. Yeah. No, that's good. It's um. They, yeah, I, I mean, I think I, I run workshops quite well, she said modestly. But, uh, so, um, so I hope I, hope I, I didn't um, jumpstart your heart too much. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was just, well, I'm actually, I'm sitting here and I'm trying to draw up a calendar. I have one of these, you see, this is my, my calendar and these are the dates and things. And I'm just filling in because suddenly there's a lot of things on. And I thought, oh. Oh my God! Have I screwed that up? I'll try not to look too desperate <laughs> in case in, in case Jane sees this. That's all right. <laughs> Just ignore any, everything I've said. It's okay. <laughs> yes, no, I, I have to set up a show tomorrow, a joint show in Canberra, and we're doing a floor talk this Saturday. So I do have an obligation mm. um, this weekend, but not in Melbourne. No, that's next month. <sighs> <laughs> I'm hoping, yeah. hoping I can be involved myself with some workshops this year, um, but I'll see how that goes as well. Um, talking about um, yeah. uh, fin finished work, um, uh, yeah. attributes of finished wear, uh, what attributes do you feel best characterizes an excellent piece of pottery or ceramics? Um, I think it's something that, that talks to you. And you, it can be, it doesn't appeal to your intellect necessarily, mm -hmm. because I see a lot of absolutely beautiful work, you know, splendidly produced, highly skilled work that talks to a host of other people, but it, you know, it, I don't want to go home with it. Um, but I, I mean, for an example, um, I got involved with um, working with Indigenous artists via a guy called Jeff Crispin, who's done a lot of development work both here and overseas, helping set up pot trees, helping people produce ceramics. And he um, was working with Indigenous communities in um, Central Australia and North Australia. Um, he was a student um, from Ivan McMeekin's school at New South Wales University. And Ivan, of course, was connected with um, Bagot Pottery in the Northern Territory um, and with Michael Cardew, you know, so there was that, that kind of connection. Anyway, um, Jeff decided that it would be good to have at the, the Brisbane Conference, um, the National Ceramic Conference, um, as it was then called, uh, to have a joint show from, um, I think it was three communities he'd been working at. And so he had this, this show on during the conference and I, I walked into it and there was a pot that I just immediately fell in love with. You know, I didn't know anything about the artist or who made it or it was as if I was transfixed by it. And I said to him, is this work for sale? And he said, oh, yeah, go and ask the gallery guy. So I went over and asked the gallery guy. I said to him, um, that pot, is it sold, that one over there? And he said, no, and I said, I'll buy it. And I didn't even ask the price. Um, and um, I, I just, I said, do you accept credit cards? 
And he said, yes. So I handed him my credit card and, and I thought I've bought, it. you know, I've bought it. I didn't even ask how much it costs. I still didn't. Um, and um, I didn't look at the receipt. I just went back to look at the pot and I thought I can touch it now because it's mine. And I was touching it and Janet Mansfield came up and she said, are you admiring my pot? And I said, your pot? I've just bought it. And she said, damn, I was going to buy that. Um, and then Grace Cochran came up and she said, I just heard that you bought that pot. Can the powerhouse borrow it for a show that I'm doing um, that's about um, design and the handmade? Um, would that be okay if we had it for that? Um, we'll ship it back to Sydney. And I thought, oh, that makes sense. You know, little did I know it was a traveling show. So me and the pot were not united for months and months, years, actually, years it was. Um, but that's what I mean by talk to you. You know, it just, you look at it and you think, I have to have that. Um, and that's, that doesn't happen a lot. And then there's a whole lot of other stuff that I, I like. I just, I think, oh, I'd like to use that. I can imagine using that. And I love functional ceramics. You know, that's where my my heart generally beats faster. Mm. Yes, I can I I know that feeling all too well. Um mm. I haven't I haven't had that credit card yet, but <laughs> um, <laughs> um but maybe that's a good thing. It was, <laughs> it, look, it probably was because it was four thousand dollars. <laughs> Oh, uh, the amount of time I, I had never. The amount of times I've looked I've never... at uh, like um, Paul Davis's work up in Newcastle, and then yeah. I was like, "Oh, I was like, I wish I had a credit card." <laughs> yeah, it's um, look, it's dangerous, and I dropped in at my mother's place on the way home, and uh, I was with her colleague Anita McIntyre. We were driving back. And I dropped in and she said, how did the conference go? And I said, oh, look, it was terrific. It was it was good conference. And guess what? I bought myself a present. And she said, oh, what was that? And I said, oh, it's a pot. And she said, well, let me buy it for you because I'm always trying to work out what to give you as a present, but you don't ever seem to want or need anything. And I said, no, 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 because I knew by now it was $4,000, which was a lot in those days. And um, she he said, no, 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 I'd like to buy it for you. And I said, no, look, you can buy me another pot another time that you choose. And she said, Janet, bring me my checkbook. And when my mother says, or used to say, Janet, bring me my checkbook, you do. And she got the checkbook and she wrote it out to Janet DeBoost and she said, and how much was it? And I said, $4,000. And she said, oh, Janet. <laughs> but to her credit, she kept writing. Oh. And it's always been our pot, you know, it's, so it's... um. She had it for a while. Um, yeah, it's quite, quite special. Yeah, and the person who, do, who, who made it is no longer alive. So um, it, it acquires, you know, more value for me um, the longer I have it. Yeah. That's one of the beautiful things about ceramics, though, like people's, the essence of people, uh, the artists, gets passed on through their work. I, 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 re, I feel, uh, especially when people yeah. devote so much, um, devote so much of their time and their effort and their passion into their work, their skills really get passed on. I, I feel, I, that's just part of my personal feeling, but I think a lot of people share that same. Yeah, no, unquestionably. I mean, they, you know, they've often been making work for, five, 10, 20, 50 years. And they put all of that into it as well, you know, because you don't get where you are at any, without having put in the work. Um, and it's, um, and sometimes it's, it's very, very moving. You know, it's, it's really, it's one of my non-pottery friends say they really like coming here because all the stuff, and I have a lot of stuff, otherwise known as pots and, um, you know, other art and craft works, everything has a story attached to it. Everything's got a story. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's it's one of the things that I like about it. It's I use it myself to answer questions about the world. You know, it's, it's how, I, how I work out answers to things. 
An- another potter I, I follow, he describes his uh, ceramics uh, as his children. And then when when he oh, when right. he sells his work, uh, he feels like he's giving away his child. <laughs> so like a part of him oh. moves on, but um, might, must be hard for he's him to sell his work. <laughs> his child. <laughs> his child. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, okay, so um, yeah. how how are you going at the moment with all the um, the pandemic and the COVID stuff going on in the world? Are you going okay? Um, has it affected you uh, business-wise? Like, because it obviously is affecting everyone. But um, how how are you dealing with yeah, it? it? Are you feeling okay? No scares. No, look, no, no scares. And I'm fortunate in that I live in a remote place in the bush, so I can choose to engage as much as I want. Mm. Um, and. My daughter lives in town, so I stay with her, and she's quite careful and um, close. But um, a lot of my life now is spent in other places, working with people in in other situations, you know, not just in my own studio. And um, I find that stimulating and interesting, and I usually work as part of a team, you know, or, or there might be a couple of us go and do some project. And um, absolutely everything for last year was cancelled. Absolutely everything. Um, it was um, the last. The last thing I did last year was in January, going out to the desert to work um, at uh, Ernabella Pukaja Pottery with Michael Kiri. That was the last thing I did. Last time I went away, and. Um, so suddenly all my projects and things just evaporated. Um, shows got cancelled. There were um, three shows overseas. Um, they were group shows, but smaller group shows. They got cancelled. Um, and, you know, suddenly <laughs> the year was empty, you know, and it was, um, I found it really, really hard to go into the studio. I found it very, very hard to make work. I mean, Ideally, one should be making, making, making. And I looked at friends who seized that opportunity and went into their studios and amassed work, you know, enough for two or three shows. I didn't do anything. I did nothing. (laughs) Um, And it's just um, now I'm actually, um, I'm rushing to finish work for a, um, a show that was started before last year, um, but got cancelled. Um, which is a collaboration with a Canberra sculptor, um, Wendy Teekle. And we've read a lot of books and we, we have um, ideas in common and we thought it might be nice to do a show together. But all of my the original intentions about how we might work and we'd travel backwards and forwards and we'd go on trips around the country and it was going to be um, our two different ways of looking at, at place um, which we were both interested in. And she's from a farming um, community and background. And so she was really interested in the way in which we contain land by putting up fences. And so mm. she uses in her sculptures quite a lot of um, uh, you know, barbed wire and fencing wire and things like that, as well as bronze casting and um, plant material, dried plant material. Um, And we started off um, coming here and she came out here a couple of times. They were the only places we went to. It was my place, my studio. Um, And so her work now, some of it in the show, is about the road to my studio (laughs) Um, and about my place, you know, my dam, um, rather than hers because that's where, where kind of work happened. And... I think for me, what affected the year also, when you live in the bush, you become very acutely aware of bushfire. Mm. And although we escaped it here this time, um, we didn't in 2004, bushfires went through here. And also the year before last, I had my own personal bushfire. It was extremely dry and um, there was a dry lightning strike 
and um, I had a hill go up in flames, you know, a bush. Um, and I could get three brigades to come out and help for that, you know, three of the uh, rural fire service brigades. But this time they said, um, you're on your own in there because we're too busy because there were fires everywhere and they were being um, reflected. So the whole of summer was was kind of tuning in, checking checking on the computer to see how far the fires had got, which ones had got out of control. So the work I've done has been, it, it all looks a bit burnt. Mm. Um, it, like I orig- yeah. I'm originally from Gilgandra. That's my hometown. All oh, right. Yeah. So I'm always Gilgandra. on the new, check, checking checking the news and checking the reports, the weather reports from out there. And I thought, oh, sometimes I'm thankful I'm still not living out there. <laughs> but, um, you know, I always miss going back out bush. Yeah, it just, um, it's part of living here. And and when we built, I, I now live in what was the production pottery. Mm. Um, once we decided to stop the production pottery, when I became head in, of the school in Canberra at ANU, head of ceramics, um, I was still trying to run the production pottery and have exhibitions and be head of, um, of the school there. And Michael said to me one day, he said, one day you're going to wake up and realise you can't do everything. Mm. And I did. I woke up and I thought, I can't do it all. And so we decided to stop the production pottery at that stage. Again, that's another thing I really love about ceramics. Like it's, you can't really function entirely on your own. You need to be connected to a community. You need to be connected to people yep. around you, um, people older than you, people younger than you, and yep. that ongoing learning process. It, it's it's very unique to ceramics. You, you don't see that much in other it, fields. No, no. When you go to, you know, other conferences or get-togethers or things like that, it's not like a ceramic conference at all. Mm. Um, it's, you know, textile artists, they all have their conferences, painters have, you know, art weeks and things like that, but there's not the kind of, as you say, community, um, coming together and also, um, the way community projects get hatched, you know, you have two people who talk and say, Hey, this might be a nice thing to do. Why don't we do it? Mm. Um, and it's really easy to get a team of people together for it. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's it's very privileged, um, and it's also it's also good because you know during a time like COVID, um, uh, you have your work at home. Yeah, it's very useful, <laughs> especially if if you're fortunate to have your own studio. It's very can be a very productive time. Um, yeah, actually, on um, and I, I sorry. sorry. No, I was just going to say I had COVID training because I was on the international committee for the Korean Biennale and okay. um, they had a, a swine flu outbreak while we were there and they cancelled the opening, the big celebration party, um, everything. You know, there were all of these people meant to come who were shortlisted from overseas and there was going to be a uh, an ongoing series of of demonstrations and you know festival and all the rest of it and so there were all these people in um in Chon and they had nowhere to go you know because they they couldn't they couldn't afford to have a crowd come and for um swine fever to break out you know to become a hot spot yeah so we had practice wearing masks um, so it was good training. <laughs> it was just the year before. Uh, someone on a, yeah. someone on Instagram, um, another potter named uh, Kirsty Collins. Uh, she's on in, on Instagram as at Sydney Art Worker. She actually asks a COVID question to you. She asks, "What would be one of the many things you have had to learn to sustain your ceramic practice or business to keep going, um, either pre or post COVID?" Um, I've had to learn to use Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> um, 
and um, I've had to get used to the idea of doing a lot of stuff um, online that I might have done in person. Mm -hmm. um, but sustaining my practice, um, I have succumbed to having um, a facsimile reprint done of one of my books. Um, that's on the urging of a young woman from Melbourne. Um, and that because there was a demand for it and because they were getting stupid prices um, on eBay um, secondhand. And so, and it was always intended to be, you know, a small, modestly priced recipe book. So um, I, I turned away from a larger project. Um, I, I was lucky because I had, um, I did have some, um, you know, financial assets I could draw on. Um, and I got, I got paid for online things that I did, workshops and whatnot. Um, but basically, if I'd been relying on what I made, I would have been in deep trouble because I was not making. Mm. And I found it really hard to um, to just make, you know, for the purpose of not quite knowing why I was making it. Yeah. So I'm afraid I'm not very helpful um, about that. But a lot of people have switched to selling online. They have opened up online shops and websites, websites and things, things like that. that. I'm, I'm actually, actually having, having a website built at the moment and it's, it's, it's all completed except for just one last thing, thing which I, I am slow on providing. Um, but I think that kind of direct selling is the way in which you can, um, you can, you know, sell yourself and your, your wares to the world. And, and people also um, are trained more to, to do online buying. You know, that's the other thing. It goes hand in hand that we do more online selling, but the public is more trained to do online buying. Hmm. Yeah, I don't like it as much. <laughs> yeah, but uh, as, um, as, you, as you've shown through your experience, um, Part of going from a hobby potter to a professional potter is learning those skills that we don't necessarily want to learn or are initially not interested yeah. and going out of our shell, out of our comfort zone to learn those skills. And I think um, this past year has yeah. shaken a lot of us up to do those things. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I think, I think that, that that's, um, as, as I say, you know, learning, learning to use Zoom, Zoom and it's, I, I don't, don't like to run, run my life mediated through a screen um you know i i i, I like phone calls um i don't mind text messaging but staring at the screen or being conscious all the time of being of keeping in the frame is um it's exhausting you know and it, it so you, you have to learn to do those things and you have to learn to I mean, I now have got my, my laptop is up here. It's about 30 centimetres above the table um, because it's more comfortable. My neck was starting to get sore. It was getting very sore from having to constantly bend at a funny angle. If um, yeah. people want to uh, contact you, what would be the best um, best way to contact you? Uh, I'm quite visible on Facebook and um, consequently Messenger. And uh, also I still have a university email address, although that will end when I cease being an honorary um, member of faculty. Um, but that's still functional at the moment. And if you just do a search for my name plus ANU, it's a standard one. It's janet.debus at anu.edu.au. Um, but, but it's there, there on the university, university web pages. Um, and uh, as, as I say, I'm contactable via Messenger or Facebook. Beautiful, beautiful. Our final question, um, if you could, uh, what was the question? I forgot. What is your, what would be your favourite book? It could be any, any sort of book. What would be your favourite book? It could be even your one on reprint. <laughs> um. No, no, I'm just, just trying, trying to think, think of books, books that, that I go, go back, back to. to. Um, 
I really, really like, like the craftsman, craftsman Richard Sennett, you know, which is that's that's um, applicable, applicable to our field. I've just this, this moment finished um, listen, listening to um, I think it's Peter Fitzsimons, Captain Cook, mm-hmm. and it moved me to tears. Um, yeah, yeah, so um, but, but I think. I think, I think a book, book like, like The Hand, and there's various, there's various essays and books I go back to that are uh, not anything to do with ceramics. Um, I like Michael Pollan as a writer, um, and he's, he's written a lot about food and the way in which we produce and eat food. Um, so I guess that's popular science writing um, I like. But um, I, I do, do like, like Richard Sennett's The Hand. And the, the other one that I, um, I like is um, uh, The Hand and How It's Used Shapes Our, our Brain, um, which is a book by um, Frank... No, I always forget his name. I can't think of it now. But it's The Hand and How It's Used Shapes Our Brain. And it, it looks at the physiological connection between um, our hands and how our brain physically gets changed and synapses form um, that have to do with things like speech and um, uh, even things as arcane as, as um, thinking creatively, you know, what do we mean by creative? Um, so I find those questions are always interesting. Yeah. Beautiful. But I think I'll probably, probably come, come back, back to it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jenna. I don't want to take too much of your time. It's been an hour. Uh, you probably want to go and check on your kiln again and make sure it's sticking over, all right? I do want to. Yes. Yes. I, I, we, the other thing we did with the production pottery was we bought a big electric kiln. Very and beautiful. it was all produced out of an electric kiln, and most people didn't know. I like, I like yeah, that about anyway. electric kilns. You can you can really um, tinker with them to make make them look totally different each time. <laughs> well, thank you yeah. very much. Thank no. you. And, thank you. Um, thank uh, you. Wish you a beautiful, blessed day, be- beautiful, blessed afternoon, and um, hope you continue to stay healthy and happy. And um, yeah, I wish you a successful firing. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the PlayStation podcast. Thank you, Janet. My, my, my pleasure, pleasure, Sean. Thank, thank you. you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye.